Riddle me this, what does Buddhist and or Hindu architecture, France's state-owned high-speed TGV and BMW have in common? Tough one, isn't it? How they're connected, you gotta wait till the end of this episode. The answer, put in a format that may make me some money with a certain Canadian, what is the Mercedes-Benz W113? The last time you and I drove a classic Mercedes together, it was a 1955 model year car. This is 10 years further forward into the future, and that's not just reflected in the model year designation, that's also reflected in the startup procedure. The equation, very similar, manual transmission, even down to the shifter knob, is almost identical to that gull wing, and fuel injection. But what's different here is there's no, like, a knob I have to pull to switch on the fuel pump to get the fuel injection to work. Here it's just clutch in, I got the parking brake on, and turn the key. Uh, like a modern day car, well, no, not like a modern day car, because most modern day cars are push button, so it's like a 20 year old car. Uh, here we go. Well, she does like to remind you that she is somewhat aged. So, with that, shall we? When one refers to a Mercedes-Benz W113, they're really referring to one of three cars. A 230 SL, which this is, a 250 SL, which was a one-year-only car, and a 280 SL, which was the vast majority of W113s that were produced. They were all inline sixes, they were all multi-point fuel injection, and if you're familiar with Mercedes-Benz naming conventions today, they kind of got off the path of connecting engine displacement with the name of the car. This, they did. So a 230 SL, this was a 2.3 in line 6, 250 SL 2.5, and 280 SL 2.8. Now there were a couple of dirty secrets about this car. Uh, number one, they were not very powerful. Uh, as a basis of comparison, that car, which is 10 years older, that's about 90 horsepower more than this. And then the bigger dirty secret about these, one would think you get a 280 SL, it's got more power. That's actually wrong. Uh, between a 230 and a 250, there was virtually no horsepower difference, but really it was a step up in torque. So there is a torque difference with a 280, but that car had more smog equipment on it. So really, getting behind the wheel of a 230 and then getting behind the wheel of a 280, you're not going to notice a big difference in terms of pushing power because these things were rear drive. And then there were the transmissions. Now that's something that was very special. All of them from day one were four-speed manuals. But very unusual for the mid-60s, you could have a four-speed automatic. Four forward gears, an automatic transmission in the 60s, that was a big deal. Uh, the vast majority of the 280s had the four-speed autos, especially the ones that came to the US. But then from May of 1966 forward, Mercedes-Benz offered a five-speed ZF gearbox manual in all of the SLs. It was one of these things that were put on the option list. Not many people took them. But then in May of 1969, they took it off the option list, but it was still like a special request, kind of like the secret menu at In-N-Out. Actually, more people know about that than this option. So much so, they only made 882 W113s with a five-speed manual transmission. Point of reference. This weighs about the same as a well-sorted two-wheel drive 993. With that, no one and absolutely no one in the classic car world would accuse these things of being fast. Uh, but there is a good amount of usable torque here. You do need to work the gearbox to get that torque out of it. I would argue these things really come alive between 3,000 and say 4,000 RPM. That's where you can really hustle these things around roads like these. But it's not just fun roads. These things are good to use around city streets. Like you could totally daily with that engine. By about the mid to late 50s, Mercedes-Benz had a rather unusual sports car slash convertible strategy. There was this very wide spectrum and on one end of it was this, literally born from a race car, later became the production tour de force of its day. On the other end of the spectrum, was the 190 SL. Now, I personally don't find them very attractive, but I think all would agree, not a very fast car. And there was talk back in the day of making it a bit faster, uh, taking a 2.2 inline six, putting it in that car, making a 220 SL in 1957. That never came to pass. Instead, they took that budget, 
put it towards a totally new car. And this is where they change strategy. Instead of having two cars, one high end, one low end, they decided middle of the road. And this was based on the W111, the Heckflosse, the Fintail car. They literally took almost 12 inches out of the length of that car to make this. But really pilfered the technology from the W112, things like a single overhead cam in line six, recirculating ball steering, and a swing axle in the back. So that swing axle out back there does a dandy job going around turns like this at moderate speeds, but a Canyon Carver, she ain't. Uh, that said, big hint vice here. This is a shorter wheelbase car. You notice it when you push it really hard around turns. Uh, the SN wants to come out. It's not just under hard braking. Uh, it's when you push it aggressively. You have to understand there just isn't a lot of weight over the back end. I wouldn't call this perfect 50-50 weight distribution, even though some of the hardware that's suspending the car, double wishbones out front, put it another way, driven at moderate speeds around town. This is a very docile car. It's when you try to get aggressive, it wasn't designed to be aggressive. And the big function of that is the overall length of the wheelbase. Like you look at some of its contemporaries, maybe not a direct competitor, but a Corvette. Even a 63 Corvette, which I would not call agricultural underneath that car, that can go around turns better than this because of the extra length, because of the extra wheelbase. This is really a different kettle of fish. A good one, but a different kettle of fish. The W113 came about not just at an unusual point in the history of Mercedes-Benz, it came about at an unusual point in the history of the car. You see, a couple of years prior to this, Volvo began to make a name for itself in safety and governments around the world stood up and took notice. And like they are today, Mercedes-Benz, they were on the bleeding edge of technology back then and the forefront was very much safety. So this was the first Mercedes-Benz ever that was built with a safety cage. First Mercedes-Benz built with crumple zones. First Mercedes-Benz built with impact absorbing bumpers. Now US cars were a little bit different. They had bumper guards, imperial units, and sealed beam headlights. And then in March of 1966, where all the cars, no matter where they went, uh, were fitted with anchor points for three-point seat belts. Now, how does that show up in practice here? Well, look at some of the switch gear. Unlike the Gullwing, there's a lot of rubber. There's knobs from the factory radio, uh, the temperature control, even in the rear view mirror. Here, this is an older car, so it's got the chrome surround. But in the later cars, like 280s, these were all black plastic. Even over here to the door, uh, they've put in a window winder that has a rubber knob on it. And then last but not least, the steering wheel has some padding here. But yes, it is indeed that time again to play our newest game options, Game Senior. That's the game where we go through the prices of these classic cars when they were new, if that information is still available, and compare them to what they're worth today, as stated by our good friend Dave Kinney, who literally writes the book on classic car values. With that, let's dive right into the 1965 230 SL that had a base price back in the day of $7,506. Now, there were a number of factory options that could be fitted to these cars. This only has two. It has the radio and it has the rear seat that faces off to the side. It's more of a torture chamber. If it had the air conditioning, that was a big deal for these things. And it wasn't like air conditioning in a Cadillac back from the mid 60s, they, they're like blue ice cubes. This was a box kind of under the dash and off to the side, and it was a lot of money. It brought the price up to $7,907. Translated to $2020, that is $65,141. That's kind of a reversal of the trend we've been seeing in previous derivations of this game where the new version of the same car is usually double the price of the car we are driving in that episode. This is a virtual bargain compared to a brand new SL today. So with that, what does Dave say this car is worth? Now before we do that, I feel it important to break out the W113 production run by model. The 230 SL, they made 19,831. The 250 SL, the one year only car, 5,196. The 280, the most popular, 23,885 for a total production run of 48,912. So not a very rare car as a basic comparison 
they only made 1,400 of those gull wings. And then interestingly, of the almost 49,000 cars that came out of the factory, 19,440 came to the US. So with that, what does Dave say this thing is worth? Well, if it was a bucket of bolts that didn't run, it'd be worth $25,300. So clearly almost 50,000 cars is having an impact on the value. Uh, but if it was a condition one car, perfect, $97,000. Now this car has some unusual ads. Uh, number one, that weird air conditioning, that adds almost 15%. This car does not have it, so we don't have to worry about it. This car does have a four-speed manual, which adds 10% to the value. And then the roof, this car has a hard top roof, uh, that would add $4,500. Now if this was a condition two car, Dave calls it for $58,800. Definitely not condition two, but definitely not a condition one car. If I'm taking a stab at this, $75,000, then considering adding the transmission and the roof, it's about $87,000 as the car sits. Now, here I have an unusual message for you from Dave, because he's very emphatic about these things. He feels too many of the people that want the W113, they pray at the altar, as he says, of the 280. He says, don't do that. Don't let a good 230 go by because you want a 280. That's a message directly from Dave. Drums in the back, discs up front, and those discs way overpower those drums. But they're usable. You could use this car around town, maybe not in panic stop settings. You'll have to get used to the rear end approximating where it used to be before the panic stop, but very much a car that could keep up with modern day traffic in terms of braking. And then there's the disc brakes. They were on offer from I believe 67 forward. They were on all the 250s, all the 280s. And in the classic car market here, there is almost a religion with these things with disc brakes. Everybody wants the disc brake thinking, I could use the car every day only with the disc brakes. That is not true. The 230 with this setup here, not perfect, but definitely a good setup, especially from 1965. Remember this, Mercedes? Well, I have an update. Did I not say this would make a world of difference? Remember Mercedes seats from the 70s and 80s? They were incredibly stiff, almost to the point where they felt like they were a bed of springs with a board on top of it. And that's kind of what they were. Uh, if you go back to Mercedes brochures in the early 80s, they'll tell you that they consulted with orthopedists and by having very stiff seats, it made the uh, driver more attentive. I can believe that, like you drive something like a Honda, you're not as attentive after coming out of like this car. And it's not just the stiffer seats, there's more support. You'd look at these things and say, oh, those are not really gonna be very supportive, but there's some lateral support, something you don't expect in a classic car. Friends, I want to take a moment to mark a special occasion. Today, July 8th, 2020, is our show's 11th birthday. And over those years, you and I have shared some incredible adventures together. However, this is the first year that you and I are sharing some incredible challenges together. As many of you know, the first part of this year, I faced the most traumatic experience of my life. And then only a couple months later, together, we face a global challenge, and now that's opened up into multiple global challenges. But rather than reflect on what's wrong, I wanted to take a moment to reflect on what's right, how you and I have been sharing this passion together over 11 years, and it's gone from just driving cars to talking to the key people shaping the car world to now some of the most iconic cars in the world that we're driving. So it's important for me to say thank you not just for being there and getting us to this point over the past 11 years, but for your incredible outpouring of support as I continue to face a very long recovery. So with that, let's get back to driving W113. One of the better manual transmissions in the classic car world. An absolute pleasure to shift gears here. I remember the Jaguar, there it's, it's kind of, you got to grind them to find the gears in that. This 
it's such a nice transmission, especially well paired to the torque that comes out of that engine. Now granted, does it make it a faster car? Like we really gotta wind this thing out going up on this hill. So you gotta stay in second gear. Once you get about four, 4,500 RPM, that's when you wanna use third gear after you've climbed a hill. But I would argue here third is more usable. You can use it around town. You can use it on like a dual carriageway. Fourth, that's much more for freeways at higher speeds. And now we're at the point where we need to talk about the history of this specific car. And unlike the Gullwing, she has not been flown all over the world to go on exotic rallies, and she hasn't gone wheel to wheel at Laguna Seca. Rather, this was the owner's crash course into how to show cars at classic car shows. However, there was a very significant asterisk there. This was not a pretty classic car when he got it. It was literally a bucket of bolts that sat in front of his dad's house and his dad wasn't driving it. And the owner likes to refer to it as after his starter marriage, he bought this car from his dad and used it as his daily. But then things started to turn around for him and bought another daily and he liked the car. So he figured, let me make it a little bit better and start showing it at some of these car shows. And he brought the car to the first car show with sheepskins on it. Sheepskins. Uh, the judges came up to him with a rather disapproving look and said, son, what's underneath the sheepskins? And he says, the seats, I think. Needs to say he didn't win any prizes, but he learned something. He learned that restoration comes from those disapproving looks of the judges. So more shows he entered, the more disapproving looks he got, the more the car got restored to the point where he has completely repainted it. This is actually a Volkswagen color. The original color is the dash. Reupholstered the seats, thank God the sheepskins are gone. Redid all the chrome, the wood trim, all that stuff to the point now where it is one of the prettiest 230 SLs you have ever seen. Now there's an interesting side note to this story. Uh, back when this car was not pretty, and it was his daily driver, uh, the owner met a very accomplished ice skater from Denmark. He took that ice skater out on a first date. 28 years later, she is still his wife. So, back to the riddle at the beginning of this episode. What do all those things have in common with this? Well, Paul Brock, who was the designer of this car, after this, he went on to becoming the chief designer of BMW, and then after that, designed what would become the high-speed TGV. But there's still one more thing. That only leaves us with the Hindu and Buddhist architecture part of the riddle. And if you've traveled throughout parts of Asia, you may have seen temples with a concave shaped roof. Take a wild guess what else has a concave shaped roof and where the W113 got its more popular name, the Pagoda. This will not come as a shock to you. These, not a lot of racing or competition history. I like the 300 SL. But I do need to point that out as a man of Greek heritage. Uh, this was entered in, I believe, 65 into the Acropolis Rally and took third place. So there is some competition history with a Pagoda.